Hey everybody and welcome to Get Your AI On The Podcast. I'm Ciprian Borodescu and this podcast is brought to you by Algolia, the AI-powered search and discovery platform. I'm the host of the show and every episode I invite founders, entrepreneurs, business leaders and even AI researchers to share with us their experience in dealing with business problems that can be solved through intelligent use of data. Let's get your AI on. I'm here with David Carmona, General Manager, Artificial Intelligence and Innovation at Microsoft. David, it's an honor to have you on this podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. You are the author of the book titled The AI Organization. And I have to say, there are a lot of AI nuggets in there, big and small, that any company can adapt and adopt in their journey to becoming an AI organization. Now, I would like to focus our conversation around building AI teams and measuring their performance, which probably it's another book in itself. But I would jump right at it by asking you, what makes the platform-based management approach suitable to AI organizations and how is that different from project-based or even product-based approaches? Yeah, that, that's an area that I'm very passionate because I, I, I see a big evolution happening in the way that we approach AI development in the companies. And it's very similar to the evolution that we had uh, targeting software, right? So addressing uh, software development. Uh, you remember, usually what we used to do with software, it was very project-centric. So meaning every project had a start and an end, right? So you have that whole concept of trying to plan everything from the project, doing in a very cascade-oriented way, and then there was a moment that the project was finished, right? And we realized that that didn't work because software is always evolving. And at the end of the day, the approach that we saw many companies uh, taking was more of a product based approach. So in a product, you don't have a beginning or an end. You are continuously improving that product and uh, focusing on making it better every time and adapting to the evolving evolving needs, right? So that's how we approach, a lot of the companies have approached AI development, right? And, and that was that was okay. That was a, a good way of approaching AI. But the scale that you need once you want to take AI to the next level and make it applicable and scalable to your entire company, that, that's a different level and it requires a different approach. And that's the concept of the platform that I, that I introduce a, a lot in the, in the book because I think it's a, it's a good approach uh, to think uh, about uh, AI development. And in that approach, instead of thinking on product-based uh, teams, you think more on providing a platform for the rest of the company to deliver on top of it. So think of uh, moving your AI uh, like development center, if you have one, into more of an empowerment approach to other business units in the company instead of trying to centralize everything by themselves and becoming a bottleneck. There's no way that you can scale if you take that traditional approach for AI development. And I saw that you're a big fan of small, highly autonomous teams within companies. And uh, this is also a model that we're having today at Algolia. And I wonder, what's the structure of or an anatomy of such an AI team in your view? And should every team be an AI team? Or should each team have an AI member or maybe more? What's the best approach? What have you seen out there? Yeah, I've seen I've seen everything, but I, I think uh, there's, there's a I can spectrum, imagine. right? <laughs> there's a spectrum in, in in what we usually see in companies, and and to be fair, uh, where you are in that spectrum is going to depend on the maturity of uh, the AI adoption in your company. So you don't want to take a, a very distributed approach with AI if you are if you are just starting, right? So at that moment, uh, it's usually better to centralize that function. And, and have everything like again serving like that platform for the rest of the company. At some point, uh, that is that is going to change. And as you embrace AI and you scale it more broader in the in the organization, you are going to require that different level of distribution where you are going to have multiple teams 
fully autonomous working working on AI on uh, connected to the business and uh, that transition can be can be very interesting and I, I also remember you probably remember too the the same transition that we experienced with software development I even uh, happened to leave that transition in, in Microsoft itself and it was it was quite an experience right because you had that concept of very functional teams. You have a huge development team. You have a huge, uh, I don't know, operations teams, a huge product ownership team. Yeah. Uh, and that changed dramatically, like uh, probably 10, 15 years ago when we started to uh, uh, realize that software development was much uh, easier uh, to scale if you just decentralize in autonomous teams, right? So we we created these teams where you have every function on them. You have development, you have operations, you have product ownership, you have everything, even customer support in some in some cases, right? Marketing even. Uh, so those those teams uh, we even changed the way that it was distributed physically in the office. So we moved from uh, having those teams side or individual members in, in offices to bring those teams together in uh, shared offices uh, where they all could collaborate, right? And that was also the beginning, the birth of DevOps, where those teams were fully uh, autonomous also on the development cycle itself. So they were on point to design, develop, operate, and then monitor and and continue that cycle. We're seeing exactly the same uh, concept for AI. So with MLOps, uh, it's very similar concept to DevOps, but applied to to AI, where those teams have full autonomy uh, to go through that entire cycle and and deploy the solution and having accountability of the results on, on that solution. Now, again, it's a spectrum and we're getting there. So I still see a lot of companies where there's a hybrid mode where you have those autonomous teams, but they are supported by a core function that may be taking some of the core responsibilities, maybe on the uh, MLOps platform or maybe on the core data science and, and roles like those. I'm just personally curious, uh, you know, due to this pandemic, uh, we started talking more and more about digital digital transformation. And interestingly enough, uh, the world around us needed to, to change for us to pay attention to dig- digital transformation. I'm just wondering out loud, and maybe you can help me navigate this uh, thought, what needs to happen for us to start talking about AI? transformation. So I already I already saw a huge change in the conversation in the market. So I, I still remember when uh, when I started this this job in Microsoft that was like 8 years ago that I, I moved from a uh, development the development division in Microsoft uh, to lead the AI business and uh, and I remember those first meetings with customers uh, they were like just asking. So I, I came to those meetings prepared, you know, uh, talking about responsible AI and MLOps and how AI is going to change everything. Yep. And they were, whoa, 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 what a second. So they don't even understand at that time uh, what was AI and what mm-hmm. they could do with AI, right? So that was those were very different times. They were asking, why should I care? I don't have those conversations anymore. So when I talk with customers now, they are they already understand that there's a huge transformation with 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 AI uh, already going on, and and because we already experienced something very similar uh, with software, how every single company had to become a little bit of a software company to be competitive in the market. They are understanding that AI is redefining software in a sense. So. Uh, beyond everything that we say about AI, at the end of the day, it's just a very cool and advanced way of creating software that is going to change it completely. And just like every company became a software company in the past, now every company will need to become an AI company. And I think there's, it's, it's very well understood already in the market. Indeed, this is, these are very interesting times. Um, I wonder how do you assess whether a company has a solid AI organizational structure or not? Yeah, I can I can tell you the the three questions that I usually ask them at the beginning just to explore where they are and there's no good or wrong answers to be to be fair uh, because at the end of the day again you need to consider the state of maturity of the company so you don't want to start directly like in the final state of a, what I call the, the AI organization where you have a fully embraced organization for for AI uh, but the, the three questions that I ask. The first one is, depending on who I have in front of me, of course, I don't ask this question to the CEO if I have a meeting with the CEO, but I, but I ask them, uh, why do they pay you? 
So what is your goal? If you are, for example, a data scientist in, or you are the leader, the, te the technical leader, or you are usually the responsible for the AI excellence center or the innovation center or whatever they are, they are calling it, what is your goal? Yeah. And, and usually uh, if, if, if the answer is not connected to the business, that's not a great sign, right? So if the answer is, I want to innovate in the latest uh, ML models, I want to deliver this, this, and that, and the answers are very technical, that's usually a, a symptom that there's no, con there's no this platform orientation. So there's no connection uh, to the business. So, uh, and then you're exploring there, why is that happening, right? So uh, is, are, are you actually a bottleneck where they are just throwing at you individual projects that you are trying to deliver on time just to get traction with AI? Or are you really looking at this as a supporting function to the business so they can operate and they can be transformed? So that's the, that's the first question. Super, super, super good questions to understand, <laughs> to understand where they are. Yeah. The second one that I do is that if you take that to the extreme, you have to be careful with another, with another force, right? So the question that I ask is, what are the latest breakthrough businesses that you are working on? Because I, I see this pattern many times where the, the moment that you become more mature on AI, you start looking at AI uh, just as an efficiency tool. So if you connect AI to the business too much, which is in theory a good thing, the counterpart of that is that you may be missing sight of new business opportunities as a disruptor to your existing business in the company. So think of how many companies have come up with new business concepts and business models just based on the software revolution that we had 20 years ago. So the same thing can also happen for AI. So if you have just an approach of AI of being an optimization for the existing business, you, you may be missing the, uh, the business transformation. And, and, and the third one, uh, the third question that I ask is just going through, uh, and this is a, a framework that we use in Microsoft that I find very, very useful. It's, it's called the Horizon Framework. Originally, I think it came from McKinsey, but it's, it's basically a way to identify and kind of visualize your portfolio of innovation. So we define three horizons, horizon one, two, and three. Horizon one is about existing investment. So existing products, how am I making my existing products better, right? So in our case, how are we adding new features in, I don't know, uh, N365? The second horizon, horizon two, is about new products, new concepts, new technologies, but aligned with existing businesses that you are targeting. So that would be like, hey, are we creating uh, something uh, new in the area of information worker? Uh, think of, I don't know, two to four years kind of horizon. And then horizon three is the long-term uh, driven by Microsoft research, for example, in our, in our case horizon. So the question that I ask is, do you know what is your percentage of investments in each of these horizons? Can you, can you tell me uh, how are you uh, balancing that portfolio in your company? The answer to that 99.9% .9 is I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, that's an interesting thing to target to address in every company, right? So you need to have a strategy that is inclusive of the short term, the medium term, and the long term, and you need to connect the dots. This is this is brilliant. Um, and in answering these questions, what have you identified as being the top barriers and obstacles to overcome when? adopting AI or building an AI organization or transitioning from a, you know, general software development to AI development? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question because one may think that given the how new and innovative AI is, the barrier is going to be technology. And it may be. So in some cases, um, you know, there's, there's of course, limitations and, and it's a whole new paradigm compared to to the ones that, that we're used to. Right? So it, it requires a, a deep yeah. technical skilling. And I remember uh, at the very beginning of this AI transformation, that was that was actually the main barrier, right? So, hey, how do I even start? I don't have the skills to approach one of those projects. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't think technology is a barrier anymore. Uh, anybody 
uh, with uh, enough uh, training can, can, can do it, right? So the, the barrier that I find is actually more about the culture required to address this AI transformation. Oh, that's a tough one. Because at the end of the day, yeah, at the end of the day, if you really want to scale this concept, across an entire organization. It's not something that you just solve by uh, providing a training to your, to your technical units. It's about changing the entire culture of the company. And that's a huge, that's a huge one. And if, if you don't do it, it's going to fail. So I see that even in Microsoft. So uh, one of the examples that, that we explain as part of our AI business school in Microsoft, which is a, a resource that, that we have in Microsoft for anybody if, if they are interested, is how we failed initially in our transformation for AI in our finance department. So at that time, finance was one of the departments in Microsoft that embraced AI at the very beginning. So they were one of the first. And uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this story, the, our CFO, Amy Hood, uh, was sharing how they started this transformation by meeting just yes, the LT in a room and getting getting uh, all you know around what can we do with AI? What is the strategy that we want to implement for AI? And they came up with an amazing strategy, beautiful strategy on on paper, right? Uh, and then they tried to cascade it down. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Imagine an organization with thousands of people uh, where you need their support to make it happen. So if you are trying to learn something without that buy-in from the organization, you're going to get a lot of friction. So people at that time, this was like eight years ago, right? So remember at that time that there was even friction because of the yeah. misunderstanding and the lack of knowledge of what was AI. There was a lot of confusion on what it could achieve and whether, hey, my job is going to be at stake with, with this thing and so on, right? So huge, uh, like, uh, uh, the friction and barriers in, in that organization. So they did it the other way around. So to change it, they actually started from the people in, in the, in the organization, in that, in that division. So they deploy a training to the entire organization. And it was not, so imagine these are not technical people. This, so this was not a training on, on machine learning. This was a training on what are the possibilities of AI and what can AI do for them. So the core concepts of AI. And then after that training, they asked the organization. So they started a process where the ideas were flowing like bottom up instead of top down, like they were trying at the beginning. And that dramatically changed the approach. So it was very successful. It was actually the organization in Microsoft with the, with the most success, just transforming themselves. So one of the processes, for example, that they use AI is the forecasting. So the, the forecasting in Microsoft from many years ago, uh, we are doing it with AI. And that was, that was freeing like the financial controllers from like uh, one of the primary tasks that they have to do. And now they can focus on other things. So huge change. If you start instead of the top down, you actually work on the culture and then from there you build the, the strategy instead of the other way around. That's amazing. And you would think that the other way around from the you know top down, it's easier or faster. And so even if it takes a little bit more time in the beginning uh, and eventually have a maybe a hybrid approach where you can meet, it, meet in the middle, I think long term that uh, can pay dividends. Uh, you describe in your book throughout the chapters how a healthy AI organization should look like, and it's a long, long, long road. Have you been challenged ever on that by other leaders in other companies trying to apply what you wrote? Of course, yeah, and, and usually the, the challenge has to do a lot, again, with the level of maturity, right? So I think uh, depending on where you are, and, and this is also a, a, a recommendation that I would do to anybody who's also working with other companies on embracing AI, you have to adapt to what, where that company is, right? And if you, if you go too much like ahead of, of them, then uh, you, you may lose them. Right. So the, it's not going to apply to them. And I saw that with many, many topics. Right. So when, when I talk about topics like MLOps, which I mean, if you are in a, in a decent level of maturity in your company, MLOps is a must. Right. Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe you are still not there and, and you have to experiment and you do need to centralize AI just, just for some time uh, to, to make it happen. Actually, in Microsoft, we did that. So in Microsoft, we started 
uh, centralizing AI in, in, in a department, in a division at that time. Uh, but then we, we changed it and we distributed that and we kept some centralized function, but we completely distributed over the organization. So it's not bad to change, to change that, right? So the organization is, is a topic where I get, of course, uh, a lot of pushback or conversations. Let's call it conversations uh, when, when we're covering it because uh, the, the, the typical thing is not my company is different or my domain is different. And it may be, but it's usually more a matter of maturity than whether uh, you know, my particular domain or industry is different. They, they actually, for embracing AI, they all look kind of similar. So they are all they all uh, want to transform the way that they engage with customers, the way that they uh, do processes in their companies, the way that they create their products, and the way that they empower their employees. Those four things they are in every industry, and they they all have the same thing. Then there there are topics. Uh, that depending on, uh, again, on the maturity, I see uh, more interest or less interest. Right? So for me, one topic that at the beginning, it was, it was actually difficult for me to have that conversation, it was responsible AI. So responsible AI, uh, the, the, the answer that I had many times is, oh, that doesn't apply to me or uh, the kind of things that I'm doing, they don't have any challenge, I don't see any, any risk of, of, of that. Uh, but but again, it's just a matter of time. They all realize at some point uh, because of the level of maturity, because of the way that they're starting to use AI on on more and more things and more important, uh, they they see that responsible AI is a huge topic that they need to address uh, sooner than later. Yeah, from what I what I've seen and discussed with other um, guests that I had in this podcast seems that responsible AI, of course, it depends on the company and their maturity, but uh, um, ethics around AI seems to be an afterthought. So I think it also goes back to what you mentioned initially, which is the, uh, the culture. Being able to have those conversations and in even discovery stage, uh, when actually drawing the uh, minimum viable product or lovable product. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's it's actually the number one thing that I say when when I have a discussion on responsible AI is don't think of responsible AI as something that you do in the development of of AI. Yeah. It's so much broader than that. It's actually a transformation that you need to do across your entire company. So every role is in some way impacted by responsible AI from the ideation, as you say, hey, maybe the use case itself, even before write a single line of code, maybe the use case itself is not even responsible. And you you need a process to really assess and, and a framework to assess uh, that uh, that fit of that use case with your principles on in your company. Uh, then, of course, in the development, yes, that's the one that as data scientists, I think we we, we all are more familiar with the tools that you can use for uh, assessing and mitigating any of the responsible uh, challenges with, with AI. Uh, but then after development, the, the, the monitoring phase is also critical, right? So just because an AI model that you created was responsible when you put it in production, that doesn't mean that it's going to stay like that forever. The data might, might change, the conditions might change, everything might change. So you need to be constantly monitoring uh, the, the, the health of your, of your AI models uh, to make sure that uh, you can address any uh, challenge that you're having. How do you challenge AI teams to build better AI products? And what's the, metrics of, uh, what's the metric of success for maybe your teams at Microsoft or and is that different from any other software engineering team? Should it be different? Yeah, that's that's the question that I think we could have another another entire podcast, right? Because it's 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 it's, it's just incredible uh, the importance of measuring success for for your AI uh, initiatives, right? And uh, I I think at, at the least at the high level, uh, what I what I want to discuss always is. What are you optimizing for? And, and I ask that question because usually what I see is that companies have like one set of metrics and they apply no matter the horizon of the project. And that is bad. <laughs> that is really, really bad. Why? Because every horizon has different 
measurements for success. So imagine a Horizon 3 project and imagine that you decide that, hey, one of the metrics that I want to have for my projects in my company is uh, the, mm, I don't know, things like efficiency. So how much money am I saving with this or how much money am I making with this with this project? If you apply that to all the projects, including the Horizon 3 projects in your company, they're going to fail and you are never going to innovate because you're going to be focused on Horizon 1 projects because you're optimizing your, your metrics for those projects. And the other way too, so if you just focus on a technical metrics uh, like hey, what is the, the level of accomplishment on, on uh, or the level of quality of those projects or things like the early adoption of projects, things like those, which are metrics more on the long term, then you may be missing uh, like, short-term accountability that you should also uh, think of for your for your AI initiatives, right? So at the end, it's having that that spectrum of, of metrics between horizon one, two, and three, and apply the metrics to the to the projects uh, for that particular horizon, right? And then, of course, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of literature on, on each of them. What are some ideas for metrics? I I, I always say that uh, uh, you have to be a little bit uh, uh, consistent in those metrics, but at the same time, uh, you have to be uh, what is the, not creative, but you th- you have to think out of the box, right? especially when you move into Horizon 2 and 3 yeah. projects. Uh, you need to think uh, for that project in particular, what are some early signs? Because at that point, what you're looking for are really market and customer signs of whether that project may be successful in the future or not. And that is an art. So it's very easy or it's simpler to uh, to measure the success of Horizon 1 projects because you can measure directly the impact in the business today. The long term, now we're talking. Now you have to look into customer signals and market signals to understand whether you were you were right or you are in the right direction or not. And I'm guessing that for 2 and 3, Horizon 2 and 3, uh, you also have to be careful about over-optimizing too soon or actually starting optimizing too soon before receiving those or recognizing those signals that you were mentioning, especially in the horizon three. Exactly, exactly. So I think the, the art here is the balance, right? So I think there's there's some goodness on uh, providing some short-term accountability to even horizon three projects because that will force you to think of smaller steps uh, and, and monetize those smaller steps. So in a sense, it's like, making sure that when you have a vision, a Horizon 3 vision, you have clear uh, steps on early horizon. And the, the example that I love here is actually not even from Microsoft, it's from SpaceX. So SpaceX, you, you ask them, hey, what is your vision? Your vision is to colonize Mars, right? So that's their, long, that's their Horizon 3. Uh, but it's not the only thing that they're doing. So in the meanwhile, they're doing a lot of stuff. So they, they have things like the vertical landing, which is critical to get to Mars, but they're actually monetizing that today as a horizon one. So that's the kind of thinking that I that I love on on when when defining a comprehensive strategy in a in an AI organization. And I also loved how you mentioned the Alchemist by Paolo Coelho uh, when you're talking about the AI heroes you covered in your book and their personal legends or their mission in life their purpose, essentially. And with your permission, I'm going to quote something that you wrote. Uh, Leaders in AI organizations are alchemists that help others to pursue their personal legends. I think that's brilliant. And then you also share that your personal legend is to find more people willing to change the world with AI and help them as you can. As I was reading these lines, I thought of asking you, in what aspects of their lives do you think people most need help when it comes to pursuing the their AI journey? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a deep question. That's a deep question. Yes, I, I'm a super, super fan of, of, of the book, the, the, the Alchemist. Of course, we all are. So who, who isn't? Uh, I, I think... Uh, and everybody will will read something different from that book. Uh, my reading is is basically that we not all of us have to have like a, a purpose uh, 
uh, like the shepherd in the story, right? So uh, some of them, some of us, uh, may be focused on helping others achieving their purpose. So our purpose may be, may be the purpose of, of our teams, right? And, and I think that's something for leaders in particular that uh, when, I, when I have discussions, not that I use this, this book as an example with them, but definitely something that I, that I love to understand because I, I think at the end of the day, the position of, of a leader in an organization is really to empower their teams to lead that a, a transformation by themselves. And your role in there should be more about helping them, supporting them, encouraging them. It's like the, the, the role that the alchemist had in that book, right? It was always there uh, and, and even going with the, with the shepherd through the desert uh, and helping them on, on all the obstacles instead of just leaving that, that whole journey. I think that's, that's, that's brilliant, right? And, and it applies to our job every day. Yeah, that servant leader, right? Behind the exactly. scenes. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think, and, and that, that's something that we also went through in, in Microsoft a lot, right? So I, I think in Microsoft we are, uh, and it became super clear during the pandemic how the role of a leader has to change, right? So the role of a, of a leader is, is for, it's of course to, to, uh, like open the path to clarify the complexity, uh, to help the team succeed. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really to be, empathic right is is to be uh, uh, to to help the the team uh, to go through that journey that's that's the most important thing and uh, you asked me about uh, what what aspect of their lives uh, whatever it, it drives you right so at the end of the day we all have ideas so uh, when i think of uh, even taking this concept of uh, ai platform one step further right so we talk a lot about the ai platform for a company and and i use uh, there's, there's, a, there's an example that i use sometimes and it's, it's a very uh, easy example in microsoft and it's the office team so in office they have they built a platform uh, uh, where everybody in office so especially of course they're a scientist but everybody in office if they have an idea in three clicks they can create a very easy environment where they can experiment. So they can create a, an environment to train a model. They can bring the, the data, data sets that they are predefined with another click. And they can even use some recipes of, of models, uh, like, for example, some foundational models and that they can use directly for that particular task. If you have an idea, you can test that idea in a matter of hours if you want, to, right? So I think that's for a company. But what I think more and more we need to think if is actually beyond the companies, how as a as a region or even as a country. So when I when I talk about all these national AI plans that, that I see all over the world, how are they providing that platform for the entire country? How do we think of a way for everybody with, with an idea to be able to to bring that idea to life because they have access to a platform that they can help them through that through that journey. I think that would be an amazing an amazing end goal for any of these AI national plans. Um, David, before closing, because this is all the time that we have today, uh, I I want to ask you, what do you read that we should read? <laughs> oh my god i i don't even know where to start so of course everything everything and uh, on the ai on the ai wall of of course I, I i have a problem and i think a lot of the audience in this podcast will have the same problem is that there's so much to read just on our domain that is difficult to go beyond that but i try to go beyond that uh, but i have to say that on the on the ai space uh, i try to to expand a little bit on on the horizons and think broader than just the technology so of course i, I read books on on technology for uh, for ai and there are there are many good ones uh, but uh, there's a couple of books i was actually uh, commenting then yesterday with, with somebody when the conversation took us to the to the philosophy side of of ai that I think are brilliant books for everybody to read, and, and it it's bringing a little bit a, a, a little bit of clarity on this whole conversation that is happening in the industry now. On hey, where is really AI going? So are we ever going to get to something like a more generalized AI? And what would it mean to have something like that, right? And and I mean that that would take not another podcast, but probably ten podcasts. Uh, but I have to say that if you want, if you are interested on that, there are two books in particular that I, that I recommend. One is, is, is actually an old one, but, but it presents a, a brilliant theory 
uh, 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 by his, uh, so the author is uh, Roger Penrose. And uh, he's a mathematician, actually. So the book is a, is a dense, deep math uh, approach to the, the consciousness. So how, uh, how do we have consciousness as, as, as humans, right? And he tried to demonstrate mathematically that the concept of consciousness that we have as humans is impossible to replicate in a machine. And he even mentioned some theories on, on what may be happening in our, in our brains with things like quantum effects happening that are really behind that concept, right? And there's no way that by using, like, for example, a Turing machine, we can ever achieve that, that level of consciousness that, that we have, right? So that's a very interesting book deep and, and it will make you think there's a there's another one more recent that i think is, is easier to read and i also love and it's a different theory on the same concept and it's called i think it's called a thousand brains really brilliant book so the the book is is basically a theory on how the brains work that's the first part of the book and it's very original so the the concept of a thousand brains is just bringing the point that maybe our brain is the same fundamental piece that is repeated thousands of times, right? And and then there's some kind of mechanism to bring all of that together, uh, which which I think is brilliant. And it has a lot of interesting explanation on why that is happening. And then taking to the next level with things like, hey, how do we extract concepts in the in the human brain? So that's that's a very interesting part of the book. The second part of the book is how does it apply to AI? Because if you compare that with the way that we're developing AI now, it's, it's completely different. So we don't develop AI. We are not thinking about AI in that way. Uh, and and, and the, the author is making the point of, and maybe we need to change dramatically the way that we approach AI. So those two books, if you have a long weekend in front of you, those I, I would recommend. Super interesting. And that's excellent. I'm actually having a long weekend in front of me. So thank you for <laughs> adding some, two, some excellent books to my uh, reading list, uh, uh, David. This is brilliant. Now, I like to surprise my listeners with a special question of the episode, one that has more weight to it, and it's a bit more delicate to answer. And the catch is that, David, you get to ask the question, and our dear listeners, you are invited to think about it, reflect on it, and answer it by commenting on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter. And in doing so, one of you can win a book on AI. So, David... What is your question or challenge for our listener? Wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go deep on this one. Uh, so let, let me maybe uh, put some context to the to the question. So uh, we we discussed today a lot about purpose uh, in this in this in this conversation, right? And I share uh, you, you brought the, the alchemist, and and I share that my purpose is, is, is to help others to pursue their purpose, right? So that, that's, that's one thing that drive, drives my, my passion. I have another one. Uh, so another purpose that I have is uh, for one particular scenario. So that scenario is, is health and in particular rare diseases. So that, that scenario, you think about it, is, is amazing. So I tell the story in the book of a friend of mine, Julian, and, and, and he founded a nonprofit, which is amazing. And the nonprofit is about uh, using AI to help doctors diagnose rare diseases. And uh, it's a huge, huge topic for AI to really change the lives for millions of people, right? And, and I'm super passionate about it. And, and, and it has, I think it has two components that everybody should think about. One is, hey, what is the the output of your purpose is it something that you think uh, will make a, the, the the world a better place? Is that something that you're passionate about? And then the second thing is that the way that you do that purpose does it? Do you like it? Uh, do you enjoy it? Because I think it's also important that that we have fun as as we get to that uh, to that journey of of the purpose. So those are the my, for me they are the two the two criteria, right? So sometimes you don't have a purpose. Sometimes you do what you do because you like it and if you do it for the rest of the of, of your life you're going to change the world equally right so uh, that that's always amazing having those two things so my question to the listeners would be okay considering that so if you take in, into account what do you love and what do you want to change in the world what would be your purpose and how can AI help you to achieve that purpose and not only I would challenge everybody to answer that question 
uh, and put it online, but also to reach out to me and, and, and ask me, uh, how can I help? Because, hey, <laughs> I have to live with examples. So if, if that was one of my purpose, I have to I have to put it to, to, to work. So if you need anything, Excellent. just ask me. I can do what I can do. Awesome. David, it was a pleasure to have you on this podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with me and with us. How can, how can people reach out to you for ideas? And yes, I mean, I, in Twitter, David CSA, David CSA, that's my, my Twitter. I'm in LinkedIn, David Carmona. Uh, and I, uh, you can send me an email, david.carmona at microsoft.com. All right. This was Get Your AI On Podcast. Thank you all for listening and be sure to subscribe. We're going to post a new episode every other week, so stay tuned for the next conversation. See you next time.